Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the Spring 2021 Sustainable Future Speaker Series. Uh, since 2005, these interdisciplinary lectures have stimulated collaboration around issues related to energy, the environment, and society here at Humboldt State. All the events are free and open to the public and are sponsored by the Shots Energy Research Center, the Environment and Community Graduate Program, and the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. We have six more talks this upcoming season, uh, and the latest information can be found at shotcenter.org slash events and the Environment and Community Program website. Uh, some more information and links are going to be dropped momentarily into the chat. A couple of housekeeping points before we dive in for the evening. If you'd like to ask a question of today's speaker, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And the presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A with the speaker. If you have any technical difficulties, uh, please post to the chat box and my colleague, uh, Maya Kelly of the Shots Energy Research Center will try to help you resolve the problem. The recording of the talk will be available later this spring at shotcenter.org slash speakers. A little bit about today's speaker, Fermin Regaras is the co-founder and CEO of Cantaro Azul, the largest water and hygiene sanitation organization in Mexico. Since 2006, he's led the design, implementation, and evaluation of technologies, service delivery models, financing mechanisms, advocacy strategies, and public policies that contribute to expanding the human right to water and sanitation. He's an Ashoka Fellow and his work has been recognized by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Big Ideas Competition at Berkeley, the Sixth and Eighth World Water Forums, and the UBS Visionatis Social Entrepreneurship Award. I personally got to know Fermin first when we were PhD students together at UC Berkeley's Energy and Resources Group, and it's my great pleasure to, and honor to welcome him tonight to our speaker series. And without further ado, uh, welcome, Fermin, and you can go ahead, start sharing your screen, and we can dive in. Thank you so much, Kevin, Arnie, and Sintana for, for the invitation. Uh, it's, I'm really excited to be here at the Sustainable Futures series, and also particularly to share the journey that we have gone through from uh, being a student project at, at UC Berkeley to starting a nonprofit organization based in Mexico, Cantaro Azul, and, and to you know all the uh, all the process that we have been going through uh, to try to contribute in a better way into achieving the human right to water and sanitation in, in rural communities in Mexico. I would like to uh, start my, my presentation by acknowledging that uh, here in San Cristobal de las Casas in Chiapas, we, we live in what, what is the territory of uh, indigenous Mayan communities, Sotzil and Celtal. Uh, these were uh, communities that did not willingly uh, cede the, the territory in which we're living, and um, and but we we honor their uh, these communities and we work together with them in in rural communities in, in Chiapas in a very close relation. I understand also that uh, most of you in Humboldt are in a in a territory that was uh, also not ceded by the Wyatt people, um, and 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 that it's a, a land uh, full of resources and and full of uh, cultural heritage of the white people and many other uh, uh, tribes in the region. And so we, we believe that it's very important to, uh, to recognize this and, and to continue uh, building bridges of collaboration between uh, the different uh, communities that, that now are living in these uh, different territories, one in Chiapas and one in California, Northern California. So I would like to start um, my, my presentation by, um, I will, if you give me one, just one second to, to share the, the slides. Okay, here we go. Um, sorry, I'm not the best at doing something in the computer and speaking. Um, here we go. So Kevin, can you just confirm that, that you're seeing my presentation in full screen, okay, please? There it is. It's not in full screen yet. Um, there you go. I think we're all set. Okay, so we have a, a little bit of lag. Um, I, I mean, the internet here is it's not the best. So we have a couple of also a uh, plan B's in case that the connection uh, drops out for, for a minute or so. But so I would like to ask for some uh, 
Uh, I mean, for some patients in case that happens. But here, okay, we'll start now. And uh, first I would like to share uh, what is the current uh, per official perspective in Mexico in terms of water and sanitation. And if we look at uh, the national statistics of access to potable water, and here I would like to say potable with quotes, uh, we see that Mexico is reporting a really high level of access to, to potable water. Uh, at the national level, we see 94%. Uh, we, when we start looking at the statistics and disaggregating it between urban and rural communities, we start to see uh, an inequality gap. And if we go even further into look at the disparities between the north of Mexico, which is more industrialized, and the south of Mexico, uh, which is more uh, rural and more agricultural uh, based activities, we even see uh, bigger disparities. And uh, however, this is the, the, you know, the numbers that Mexico uses and a lot of the public policies in Mexico are based on these numbers. So Mexico now is trying, for the past 10 years, has been trying to increase the percentages to try to get closer to that 100%. Uh, however, you will see in my presentation that the reality in the field is way different than what these numbers tell us. Um, in these graphs, I, I just want you to look more at the, the, the trends. Uh, the, if you look at the, the red lines, that's the, uh, the straight red, well, not the straight, the, the continuous red line is the urban population. And so we see from 1990 to 2010, the urban population has gone from almost 60 million people to almost uh, 90, 85 million people. And, and in the same way that the urban population has grown in Mexico, access to potable water in official numbers has been following that, that path. However, in, in the rural case, we see that the population has hovered around 25 million people. It has remained quite stable. And although there has been, um, the, the bridge is closing or the gap is closing in terms of people who have access to potable water, which has gone from almost 12 million people to almost 20 million people, uh, we see that most of the people that have gained access to safe water has been in the urban community, in the urban uh, uh, areas with more than 30 million, million people gaining access to, to potable water, whereas only 10 million people in rural communities have gained access to water. So we start to see how public policies and public investment uh, has really concentrated on urban areas and, and has uh, disregard, dis disregarded rural communities. One of the other, uh, again, in, in this graph, I mean, it has a lot of information, but there are basically two trends. One, that it stays quite flat and, and it's looking at the percentage of people with access to water and, and sewage. Uh, going from the 1990s to uh, 2013, from about 70% to 92%. Now, the figures that we're reporting are closer to 94%. And so we're seeing this it continues going up in terms of more access to, to potable water and, and sewage. Uh, and, and what the government uh, tries to put together in this graph is how mortality is in, on kids under five has dropped dramatically in the, dropped dramatically in the 90s. And, and they try to attribute the investment in infrastructure in these rural communities and increase coverage uh, with this uh, uh, having this impact of improving uh, uh, health and reducing uh, children's mortality. What this graph doesn't show, and it's a graph that it's used a lot, again, to shape public policies and public investment, is that actually morbidity, people getting sick of gastrointestinal illness, has not really changed in rural communities. And, you know, getting diarrhea is something that we you know, most of us have experienced uh, a few times and we don't like it, but it is different than having a continuous diarrhea or chronic diarrhea. Chronic diarrhea is, is very severe. It really affects and limits the, the potential of millions of children in Mexico. Uh, chronic diarrhea is the main contributor to malnutrition. And so if you can imagine uh, kids growing up in rural communities where very few services exist in these rural communities in a uh, in a country with a lot of inequality, when they grow up with chronic diarrhea, it's like the slope gets steeper for them and their chances of, of, of developing the, to their full potential get really squashed and only a few uh, basically kind of win the lottery and are able to, to develop their full potential. But 
uh, most the majority of kids are are being their potential is being limited by by ongoing diarrhea and and we will see how this is very closely linked to a vision that uh, water in order to really improve health needs the a water service needs to be sustained and you need to have access to save water and not only have the pipes in your home with water being distributed in a sporadic basis and not with good quality. And so in countries like Mexico, uh, in countries in, in Latin America, like Mexico, uh, one of the biggest issues that we face is inequality. And, and we see it in a daily basis, how uh, gastrointestinal illnesses just perpetuate that inequality by diminishing the, the potential of millions of children as they grow. And in Mexico, with the help of the international community, it's, it's starting to, to pay attention to this and starting to look at other indicators. Uh, again, here on the first two columns on the left, we see the official indicators of access to, uh, to water, uh, to pipe water on the left and to uh, sewage on the right. And, but when we look at other indicators that different Mexican institutions have collected, we start to see how these numbers start to drop. And, and finally, when we look at the joint monitoring program, it's an initiative by the World Health Organization and by UNICEF. Uh, they have also looked at indicators in Mexico of water and, and sanitation, and we basically dropped to less than 50%. So, so there is evidence at, at the national level that, that the public uh, policies and public investment has not worked. Uh, however, like the details are not very well known. And, and here's where the experience on the field that we had first as Berkeley students and then as Cantar Azul, and then working in more collaborative ways is helping us find a path for the future to understand what needs to change and how those changes need to happen uh, in order to tackle one of the main issues that we're facing as a country. Uh, so in this um, next part of, the, of, of this presentation, I wanna talk about that direct experience that we had as students, many of you in the, in the audience are, are students. And, and we have really the privilege of being in a, um, in a moment where the universities were supporting uh, student research, student practice, and helping us as students lead projects uh, to really understand what are the challenges on the field and to propose solutions. And so my, I did my master's and PhD research at the Energy and Resources Group in Berkeley. And with the collaboration of many students in, in an interdisciplinary uh, team, we were able to document water quality in rural communities in Baja California. This is a typical household in, in rural communities in Baja California. And in this slide, you can see the water sources that most families use. You can see that these are shallow wells or, or springs nearby their, their households. Uh, in the second row, you can see pictures of how people uh, bring water to their homes. They, many times they do it by carrying buckets. Other times they have improvised um, hoses where they can either pump or by gravity bring water to their homes. And sometimes they have to truck water. And it's also very typical that people store water in the home. They differentiate the water that you're going to use for drinking and cooking than the water you're going to be using for other, other domestic uh, purposes at their households, but they basically store water in these uh, traditional containers made out of clay or rock, um, which from a, a lens of microbiology, they are, these, these containers are not safe. These, are, these containers, uh, you, you access the water through a cup and you contaminate the water because the, the hygiene is not perfect in, in the household. There are, there are a lot of factors that, that, that create paths for pathogens to get into the water. Uh, but from the perspective of, uh, of a house or of someone that lives in this home, these pots are perfect because first of all, they, they're usually given away to them as presents when they get married, when they start a new family. And so, so they, ha they have this like family connection of being a present or being something valuable. Uh, there are sometimes also expressions of art in the home, something that you're really proud of. So when you arrive to one of these households, they invite you to visit this pot to drink water from it. And, and, and one of the really important things is that they keep water cool, that the water uh, seeps through the clay or through the rock and then evaporates in the surface and cools down the water. So if you are in a hot place, 
uh, this is a great, and you don't have electricity, this is a great place to have uh, fresh water that you're really going to um, uh, be satisfied when you're drinking from it. And it's also gonna to appeal to many other dimensions. So one of the first things that we learned by working months with, um, with different rural communities and spending time uh, with families and learning from different perspectives, how they value water, is that they, you know, water is not seen from one perspective, from health or just from an economic perspective. Water is seen from multiple perspectives, religion, from a religious perspective, from a traditional family cultural perspective, and even from aesthetic perspective in terms of the taste, the temperature. And, and I think this really differentiates water from many other sectors like rural electrification or, or agriculture or other aspects in which people are valuing water through the, these multiple dimensions and thus it becomes much more complex uh, to work on water um, issues or water projects. And, and it's also even more important to have an interdisciplinary or even better our transdisciplinary perspective in which the knowledge and the perspectives uh, of different angles are brought together to integrate uh, the understanding of a problem or to integrate the development of a, a solution. Um, what we see on this slide is the development of many household water treatment uh, options. And, and this, is, this is a very important effort because many rural communities don't have access to pipe water and will not receive access to pipe water in the, recent, in the near future. And, and so, uh, you know, many organizations and advocate, uh, advocates uh, see like the challenges of what, what can be done. And, and by developing household water treatment solutions, we think that we can empower households to access safe water and to improve their health. Um, most of the, I mean, the, all of the, all, all, all of the different water treatment options, like using clay filters, um, uh, other types of ceramic filters, solar disinfection, boiling, using chlorine, or, uh, are really effective in, in, in reducing pathogens in the water. But we tend, and it is very common, that we design solutions mostly from one perspective, whether that's the engineering perspective, the health perspective, or, or the economic pers perspective. And I think one of the challenges is how that, that we need to integrate more uh, how people value water, as, as I have mentioned in, uh, uh, a few minutes ago. And so in a similar way, uh, as students, we saw the opportunity to empower people in, in their homes to access safe water. And we designed a UV disinfection system. This system uses ultraviolet light to disinfect water, and it's as effective or, uh, as the other ones. It has some advantages in the sense that it treats water very fast. So in, in less than five minutes, you can uh, fill a jug of 20 liters, which is about four to five gallons. And, um, and so it's very fast, doesn't change the taste of the water and people really like it. We tried to design the system through a series of, of processes in which uh, we learn through the communities of what they like and what they didn't like. Uh, initially, uh, before we understood that people value many dimensions of, uh, in, in their water systems or water pots, uh, we were designing something that was very basic that could be built with locally available materials, as you can see on the first and second picture in the top. And, and we tried to make it as cheap as possible um, and as basic as possible so that it, we were thinking more of the engineering, the cost and the public health perspective. But as we understood that people were not going to give up other options where they had water that was cooler, that they felt proud to have it in their home, uh, we, we saw that we needed to invest in making this system more attractive to people uh, so they could feel proud of having one of them. And also, um, we tried to, for us, it was very important that water will not be contaminated. So we use these uh, water jugs, plastic water jugs, they're reusable and they have a narrow neck so that it is more difficult to contaminate the water. Uh, but, but the water was really getting warm in, in these containers. So we had to uh, cover them with a cloth, a denim cloth that people would water in the morning and by evaporative cooling, it would do the same trick as the traditional water pots. And, and so little by little, we started to get much more um, as students, when we were designing these, these solutions, we started to get um, a more um, adoption in terms of people. People were much more happier with the products that we were developing and, and also using them in the long term. 
in parallel to that in, in the university, it was it's a really good partnership between starting an organization on the ground and, and being able to, to get that reachfulness of, of what people are perceiving and being able to design something with human-centered design principles, interacting with the community and, get, and designing something that made sense for the community. But at the same time in the lab, we were uh, making improvements on the technology to increase their effectiveness and also to, uh, to ensure that that water was was being uh, treated in an in a adequate manner and to make the system smaller so it could be more replicable and, and cheaper. And, and this led, uh, we were able to, to carry out a large study in more than 400 households. Um, uh, and in this, it was a very rigorous study. We looked at, at the water quality. And, and here in this graph, you see uh, five columns. The first column uh, on the left is the, the quality of water that people had in the city in terms of pipe water. The second column is the many people in Mexico buy bottled water because they don't trust pipe water. And, and so when they buy bottled water, we saw uh, this level of contamination in, sorry, I didn't explain, but in the, uh, in the yellow graph, yellow, red, and orange is contamination of E. coli. This is a fecal coliform. That means that feces were in contact with water. So the blue is the, the percentage that is safe to drink. And, and the other colors are the percentage that is not safe to drink. And, and then we also looked at some families were buying bottled water in the rural communities. And we saw that bottled water in rural communities were, was more uh, contaminated, around 20% of the samples were contaminated as opposed to five, 7%. And, and this had to do with even these safe containers, um, uh, they, in a rural house, you have animals on the house, you, you have also more dust coming in. And so you see how the environment in which we're living affects the quality of water, even if it came from the same companies that people were using in urban areas. And, and so with the Mesita Sul, with the, with, with the technology that we ha had designed, uh, we achieved similar results as the few families that were buying bottled water from urban areas and bringing it to the rural homes. This is, the four, this is the fourth column that, that I'm speaking about. And so you have a relatively similar result. And here, what we are able to show is that even the results are not perfect, uh, they, they are a significant improvement from what people are drinking, uh, which is the fifth uh, column on the right, we, where about 60% of the samples are contaminated. Um, here, uh, so, so we're able to show that with an appropriate technology, uh, rural households can treat their water and basically achieve the same quality of water as a company in an urban area that is bottling the water and delivering into these rural communities. But only a few households are buying the, the, bottle, the bottle water because it's expensive, it is, you need to travel a lot to get it. So, so we are able to design a technology that when used by people, not by our teams, and we, they, we are able to achieve a similar level of, of service or, or quality of the water than, than buying bottled water. It was, it was something that we saw as good. Of course, we saw opportunities to, to improve a quality of water. Uh, also, we, we see a, a, a big challenge in, in this graph. You can see the quality of water coming from the outlet of the UV disinfection system with very few samples being contaminated. This is when people operate their system, so they don't operate it perfectly. And, but, but in general, the water that is coming out of the system is, is pretty good in terms of quality. Then when it's stored in the container, and it might be stored for two or three days, uh, we see some contamination. And then when people pour water into the glass, then is, there's a little bit more contamination happening in the glass. Uh, so basically one of our results of this partnership between the nonprofit organization that we co-founded and, and the research team in Berkeley is that we, uh, we were able to understand where contamination is happening and, and to identify that the, although there's a big improvement occurring when there's a household water treatment technology, um, there still needs, there's still a need to improve the hygiene of the home and hygiene practices to, to really reduce the contamination that we are observing. It's important to note that the contamination that happens inside the home, it is not as um, worrisome as the contamination that is coming from outside the home because the contamination that happens at the home, it's, 
these are pathogens that are already moving inside the home through other channels as well, like through hands or through food. So, so it's more important to reduce the contamination that is coming from outside, which is something that these household water treatment technologies were able to do in an effective way. And, um, and, and this is also, I mean, this could be also a complicated graph. What I want you, what I would like you to get out of it is uh, in the circles, it is the, the, the indicators of the families that were using the Mesita Sul, the household water treatment system. And the squares, which are usually below, are the control group. So what families are using normally without uh, a UV disinfection system. And then in the different columns, we go from indicators that are related to adoption of safe water practices, to knowledge related to safe water practices, to access, then to habits, and then to exclusive habits. And, and the most important, uh, uh, how do you say, the most important thing that we learn from this by measuring these different indicators is that usually we, when we do an intervention or a project, we stay with the indicator on the left, which is have people acquire a technology, whether it's a solar panel, a cook stove or a household water treatment technology, have they acquired that technology? And, and so here we saw that in the control group, only 40% of households had acquired some practice or technology related to uh, safe water. And with, when they were offered to purchase a UVD system, 90% uh, of the families decided to acquire one of these technologies. So we saw a really good adoption uh, rate. Um, but what, if we move to the columns in the center with access, we start to see a drop that goes from 90% of families adopt a UV system to only 7, 70%, 60 to 70% have access to safe water in a given basis, in a visit, on announced visit. Uh, so, so we see this drop from 90% to almost 60%. And, and you know, sometimes we get stories like, well, we were using the system, but, but we haven't filled the container today. We don't know if that's the case or if, or if people are telling us that and they have not been using it. So we wanted to be really strict. And we were, when we were really strict, we had to test if water was available and if it was safe to drink. It is still something that we were proud of in terms of like the, the control group, only 20% had access to, to consuming safe water. And with the intervention or with the, with the, when the UV system was promoted, that went from 20% to 60%. So it was a good improvement. Where we became really worried is in, in terms of this exclusive habit, the last two columns, where people already have access to save water at 60%, but there was a further drop to 50 and 40% in terms of if they were always drinking water uh, from these safe containers. And, and here, it, it's something that we didn't expect. We expect if you have access to safe water, they're always gonna drink safe water because we did trainings of how the importance of, of safe water. Most people understood that there were bugs in the water and that in order to reduce diarrhea, they had to drink safe water. So we really didn't understand what was happening. Why, were, why was there this big drop? And, and basically what, what we came to understand with a lot of field work and, and also not only with the statistics of the results, but but with in-depth interviews with families, uh, we understood two things. One is that uh, here, is a, here are the set of pictures of, of uh, places where people store water in the home. And you can see in this set of pictures that even though families have a UV system with safe water on it, they still need to store water in other containers for other purposes. And, and so in these other containers, uh, the water doesn't stay safe anymore, uh, but, and, and so in some families, especially the ones that are more interested in their health and that they have more time to make more actions, everyone in the family only drank safe water. But half of the families are living a really complex and difficult life, uh, and they have to struggle with many challenges in a daily basis. And so be, strictly drinking safe water is something that doesn't occur. And, and the big problem with this is that 
although we believe that we were empowering people through these household water treatment technologies, we didn't realize that we were transferring them also responsibilities and burdens. And these responsibilities and burdens um, uh, really um, make it more difficult for families that have less resources. And so again, when we think of a country that has inequality and the communities have inequality within themselves, only those that were doing better were able to derive benefits of the technology. And those that were not doing better, they, they didn't fully derive the benefits of the technology. And so we continue without, you know, without being our intention, we continue to perpetuate the inequalities that exist in the community. And you can imagine like we were, we had been working on this project for, you know, more than five years and to be able to reach this conclusion, it was really, <laughs> it, it, was, it, it was in a way devastating for us. Um, so we really had to think of what needs to change uh, in order uh, to, to, to ensure that, that water projects uh, really have a public health perspective and really are able to uh, reduce that inequality. And um, around that time, I, I'm looking at, at the time that we're now, and, uh, and I need to go a little bit faster, but around that time in, in 2014, uh, we, we were able to carry out uh, a water quality study across uh, 300 communities in Mexico. This study was not anymore on household water treatment systems. This, was, this study was on pipe water systems. And, and what we, I mean, there are many lessons that we, that we, we got through looking at this study, but uh, imagine that we went to 300 communities across the country and these systems had been implemented between five to 10 years by, by the government. And, and, and they really brought a benefit because before them, people had to fetch water from a source uh, several meters or even a kilometer away. And now they have pipe water in the home. But what we realized throughout this study is that uh, families, uh, they were receiving water in a sporadic basis uh, in most cases, in most communities. And, and also, the quality of the water was was not good at all. I mean, all those systems uh, in there, uh, they were meant to have disinfection uh, uh, and, and treatment elements. Uh, the majority of them were not operating. Only less than 20% were chlorinating the water, mostly in the north part of Mexico. In the south part of Mexico, almost none of them were chlorinating water. And, and because of this, uh, what we observe is that uh, around 40% of the water was coming to the home on the tap uh, had E. coli and was contaminated. Then people store it in their home and the contamination even went further up to around 60%. And, and so we reached a, a really similar conclusion. Um, again, you know, the infrastructure was meant to empower communities to have access to water and, and especially safe water. Uh, but again, a lot of the responsibilities were, uh, were just passed in, a, in an intangible manner. They were passed to, to committees in the communities without any continuous training, uh, without uh, the, the government was not present really after the, the implementation of the infrastructure. And, and because of that, most very few communities were able to derive like the full benefits of having a pipe water system, but the majority of them, uh, you know, were partially deriving uh, benefits. So the same lessons that we observed with household water treatment technologies, we were observing them now with pipe water infrastructure in the communities. Um, I'm going to run through a few slides that I'm that I'm skipping here, and and then start to share what what we see that can, can really be the path forward. Um, so one of the things that we learned by, by look, working on all of these uh, rural communities is that in all of them, there was a water committee in existence. Uh, however, the water committee was really not receiving any training, not receiving any follow-up. And as, men as I mentioned, they were absorbing, more than being empowered, they were absorbing a lot of these responsibilities and not being able to work with them and to, and to be able to meet um, the goals in the communities. 
so, so what we, in, in reality, what these water committees were doing was basically operating in a very simple basis, the, like turning on a pump and turning off a pump and, and operating in a very simple basis uh, their, their systems. However, when we looked in, when we looked at other countries uh, in Latin America, we started to see that there were many cases where the, commu the communities had started to partner with other communities to share experience around water management and, and also to have a unified voice between them. And that unified voice was very important because they were able to change the way in which government programs and government investment occur in their communities. And, and especially they were able to increase the, the investment that came in to, uh, to, to, to have more training for, for these uh, local committees. Uh, when we talk about community-based water management or gestión comunitaria del agua in Spanish, the community, th there's an aspiration that community-based water management uh, is able to work with the sources of water, to protect the sources of water, to conserve the land where the water is being absorbed and then, uh, go, uh, and then keeping the, the sources clean and pl with plenty of water throughout the year. Then there's, of course, the operation of the system itself, which includes uh, pipes, includes uh, storage containers, it includes the treatment and the disinfection facilities. And then uh, another element of community-based water management is working with the community so that the community becomes also responsible for um, participating in activities to sustain the pipe water system and the, and the water sources, and that they also pay for some of the basic uh, elements that are needed to operate the system and to and to be able to replace parts to extend the system when new families come in and and also for for these community based water system uh, organizations to start working on sanitation so that they do not contaminate the water that communities downstream are using uh, this is in mexico we don't have any of these we have only like the very basic part of operating the system and when we see other communities in Peru, Costa Rica, eh, Ecuador, we were observing that they were taking on more of these responsibilities because there was a better partnership between the water committees, their communities, and also across other, um, across other, other communities. And so what we started to develop in, in Cantaro Sul as an organization, after what we had learned uh, being a, a project working together with Berkeley with household water treatment, and after we have done this uh, very um, a big study in across Mexico is that we started to, to think like the path forward is to strengthen community-based organizations. And so we need to work on, uh, on improving technologies because most of the technologies that, that are part of government uh, programs, they're really a small scale version of what works in the city. But what works in a community doesn't have to be a small version of what works in the city. It, it, it should be really designed for, for a community, whether it's a household system or, or whether it's a pipe system. Uh, they, they, there are many elements that really need to be designed for, for, for a rural uh, community. But also the community-based organizations, uh, in addition to having uh, technologies that are appropriate for them, they also need to, they also need water quality testing systems or, or devices or, or kits that are able to, on, you know, to understand what are the challenges that they're facing and understand if their service is improving or not. And they also need uh, better methods and of interacting with their uh, methodologies to interacting with their communities so that they can provide a, a more in integral service into their communities. Another element that we believe is essential and, and we don't really see uh, that the human right to water is going to be able to improve in Mexico without this, is that these communities, these committees need to be able to sit together with organizations like Cantar Azul and with the government and the authorities in a, in, in a table, in an equal basis. And, and right now the asymmetries are really big. And, and you know, a, a community-based water management person only represents their community. So their voice is really small. So we think that at the municipal level, these uh, community-based organizations need to form an assembly 
that, that represents them, that gives them more power, and that we can work in, a, in an equal basis, in a symmetric basis, to shape public policies, to shape how investment uh, happens in, at the municipal, state, and federal level. And finally, really, in, in Mexico, we have the human right to water recognized in our constitution since 2012. And it's the responsibility of the authorities, the municipal, state, and federal authorities, that the human right to water is achieved. Um, so it's important that this responsibility is not only left to the communities and their assemblies, uh, the municipalities and the state, uh, they also need to absorb these responsibilities. So, so we believe that the, the assembly of community-based organizations needs to form public community partnerships. We have seen in Mexico and many other countries how, uh, the, um, how public policies have tried to come up with public-private partnerships. And, and we really have evidence that that doesn't work uh, in the water sector and even less in rural communities. But, but what we could do is change the power and, and really think of public community partnerships where there is an empowerment happening to the community-based organizations, but there's also a responsibility that it's absorbed by, by the authorities to ensure that these community-based organizations have all the tools, all the resources that they need in order to provide safe water, uh, so safe water services. So, so this is in theory, you know, what the concept that we, we believe needs and, and the way forward that we need, we think that we need to move forward, but, but it's really challenging to go from an image, a dream, something that conceptually makes sense when in Mexico, there are not experiences like this. So in the past three years, we have been working uh, with different municipalities to try to make this true and to try to make this uh, a reality. And, and one of the success stories is Berriozabal, it's a municipality here in Chiapas. And, and it's, a, it's a municipality where we were able to partner with the, uh, with, the, with the municipal president and with the local authorities. They understood that they, they were committed to, uh, to really improve the human right, to really ensure the human right to water made progress in the municipality, both in the capital, in the urban community or urban location, and also in the rural communities. And, but they understood that they didn't have the staff or the resources to be able to provide safe water services to more than 100 communities. So, so they, they believed in this model. They went to Ecuador. They saw a similar experience. And together, we were able to design the first community public um, organism in Mexico. Uh, this organism, it's, it's basically a decentralized organism of the municipality where the highest authority is the, um, like the, the board of directors. And more than half of the board of directors are appointed by the rural communities themselves directly. And, and, and the other, uh, maybe uh, like around one third are appointed by the municipality. And there are a few other participants like uh, civil society organizations and also the state uh, water institute. And, and with this, uh, the municipality, which usually has their authority cycle every three years, what they're creating now, it's a legacy of, a, of an institution, of a, an authority that really responds to the communities uh, in, a, in a cycle that is not related to, um, to the election cycle, which has really disturbed uh, uh, water programs in Mexico. And, and so we have seen in the past two years how this, this partnership has been able to uh, achieve the human right to water in, in about 30 communities. And, and it's, although it has some struggles, it has really uh, created a model that, that, that has all the potential to work for this municipality and that can be replicated in other municipalities as well. Not in all of them. And we have examples like Citala, which is a Celtal commu uh, municipality uh, here in the highlands of Chiapas, where where the authorities for decades have ignored the, the important things of the rural communities. And, and so the rural communities have not been able to work on water projects because the municipality does not receive them, does not collaborate with them. And so in that case, despite and without the, the municipal authorities, the, the water committees of Citala uh, last year, they formed the, the first a partnership of community-based organizations. 
in, in Mexico as well. And, and they are able, if, if they cannot collaborate with the municipal government, by forming this partnership of more than 30 communities, uh, they're able now to have a direct dialogue with state and federal authorities, which are seeing this also as another model where the, the collaboration does not happen in the, in the, with the local authority, but where they, 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 they can have um, a partner on the, on the region that, that is, if the federal government invests, they know that there's the capacity in, in these uh, community-based organizations to really sustain the, the infrastructure and really to sustain the services. Uh, so this has been also an, a, a really like important achievement. And, and we're still uh, you know, in, in the very early stages where, where we're seeing, where we seeing this community-based uh, water management and making steps in Mexico, strong steps, small steps, but creating uh, important impact in their communities and, and also creating a model that can be rep adapted and replicated uh, to other regions. Um, it is, I mean, this journey has, has had many ups and downs. Uh, as an organization, we have also learned that it is not, so, I mean, the, there are thousands of communities in Mexico that, that are struggling with water problems. So we cannot develop a model in which we bring the solution to the community. We will never uh, be able to to make a significant difference at the national scale if, if we rely only on ourselves as an organization to, to bring this impact. But however, the impact and the, and the work that we do directly on the communities has really allowed us to understand what are the main challenges uh, to what are also the resources that communities have and, and to be able to, um, uh, to change the strategy that we have now as an organization, which instead of bringing these technologies in a house-to-house -house basis and household-to-household -household basis, uh, we, we focus now on strengthening a community-based organizations. Of course, sometimes we, go, we work in the field with them with installations of pipe water systems, household water systems, and other type of solutions. But, but what we're really doing is try to construct models, try to understand what works, what doesn't work, and trying to create also connections between the rural communities and the, and the authorities, which really have the responsibility of achieving the human right to water. So there are many other aspects in which we have started to work as an organization, and, and I'm happy to talk more about them in the, in the open questions section of the, of the, uh, of the seminar. Uh, but I, I would like to wrap up here uh, with saying the path forward we see it is strengthening community-based organizations, which, which exist in most rural communities in Mexico. Uh, we believe that they need to have a voice that's where they can be represented directly, not represented through organizations like us. And, and that voice, uh, uh, in addition to being able to have more power so that they can uh, negotiate in, a, in an equitable basis, they can also share experiences and best practices among them. And, and they're really like the change makers and, and, and kind of the strength of, be, um, of being able to construct the, and achieve the human right to water and sanitation in rural communities in Mexico. So um, I, I would like to stop here and, and, and thank to all of you for you know, listening to our, our journey and how we have moved from a you know, student project uh, as an organization uh, that was working directly in, in these in this communities to an organization that now is trying to, through systemic change, knowledge management and development and implementation of, of solutions, trying to uh, make a difference in Chiapas and, and other regions in Mexico. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Fermin. This is really interesting and, and frankly, really inspiring. Um, I want to encourage our attendees, uh, if you have any questions, uh, to, to use the Q&A box at the bottom um, to ask those questions of our speaker this evening. Um, I, I really appreciated, uh, in particular, the sort of honest and frank assessment that you brought, I mean, to the work that you're doing and, and the challenges, the, the potential to be creating new uh, sources of burden or inequity in rural communities. And I also, because, you know, I, I have an academic background like you do, I appreciated your, um, the sort of rigor with which you were evaluating your um, your interventions and, and to understand exactly where the challenges were, were creating. 
Um, ha has your organization pivoted um, more or less completely away from the, the technology development and dissemination work that you were doing earlier, or is it just an evolution and that work is still ongoing? Uh, we still, I mean, I, I think there was both an evolution and a pivot. Uh, the pivot happened mostly from thinking that with technologies and with training, we were empowering uh, households and communities to deliver safe water services. And, and when we looked at the evidence, both at the household level and the community level, uh, we understood that the empowerment came with a lot of burdens. And, and so the pivot was to move from, um, let's say technology and infrastructure to services. We really believe that there has to be a shift, especially in the water sector. I think many of the lessons that we have uh, gained apply to other appropriate technologies and other uh, sectors in rural development. But, but especially in the water sector, uh, it's critical to move from a paradigm of investing in infrastructure to a paradigm of creating services. And, and in creating services, one of the key elements is distributing responsibility according to the capacities of each of the nodes of the service. So, so there are responsibilities that need to be absorbed by household members, whether it's to operate a system or to uh, participate in certain activities in a community, in a type of community system or pay a fee you know, for being able to cover ongoing services. Then there is another node, which is the community-based organization. Then there's another node, which is the representation of those community-based organizations. And then you have other nodes which rely more on authorities or organizations like us. So I think that was a pivot. And, and then there's the evolution of, I mean, we continue to work on, uh, a, a, I mean, sanitation, for example, I didn't talk about it enough, but here in Chiapas, we have more than 200 uh, water uh, sanitation, uh, so, sorry, like sewage treatment uh, uh, facilities and less than 10 work. And, and this is because most of this uh, infrastructure was thought of like it works, but you need to pay electricity and communities are not paying for electricity. It's a big burden on their economy. And so they stop uh, operating it. They also usually, as I was saying, these, these treatment, uh, sewage treatment facilities, they're kind of a small scale of what works in a city. So you don't have the economy of scale in the city and it ends up being really expensive. And so we need to develop a newer technology or different technologies or alternative technologies like um, a wetland uh, or, or wetland uh, uh, treatment, which, which doesn't require electricity. In a place like Mexico, where there are only two or three wetland facilities, if you don't see it, it is really hard to believe that it's something that you can, you can do. So, so we continue to work on, on the design and implementation of, of technologies, mostly to uh, we're not interested in replicating our direct impact. Even if we multiply it by 10 or by 100, it would still be a small scale for like the, the thousands of communities that exist in Mexico. Um, so, so, so we do it more mostly to, to show that this is something possible and, that, and to create models that can be replicated. Excellent. Um, so one of our attendees asks, uh, is there a process that you follow to identify a suitable community for work and collaboration? How do you go about figuring out where, where to work, do this work? So, so here, when we moved to Chiapas, because we started in the Baja California Peninsula and we're now based in Chiapas, uh, we, uh, I mean, we had already experienced as an organization. We understood that if, you know, if we went to each of the communities, uh, I mean, it, it will be starting a new relation and it will be difficult. So we spent several months talking to other organizations that worked in these rural communities. Many of them were installing uh, uh, rainwater harvesting systems for, um, uh, how, for orchards, like local orchards and, and, uh, and, and doing other rural projects. And so first we started to work with these other organizations. And, and it was great because there was a transfer of trust from these other organizations to our organization. Uh, then after two years of working 
uh, with these organizations, we started to find one of the one of the biggest problems that we have encountered, which is uh, in rural communities, particularly in Chiapas, there has been a, a direct effort to try to split the communities, to divide them, and and to have have less representation and power. And whether this is done by religion, by political parties, by government programs, or either by organizations without trying to do damage, but but it actually splits the communities. So once we were working with, say, let's say, with a group of families in a community, about 50% of the families, you know, the human right to water has a principle which needs to be universal. So when we try to expand our work to other families in the same community, there was a big resistance. And in most communities, we, were in, we, weren't able to do, we were not able to do it because they identify us as working with only one group of households. So, so we had to go to the assembly of the community and, and really say like, if you, I mean, we are now gonna work with a, a principle of universal access to safe water. And so if you need to decide as a community whether you want to continue working with us or not. And, and about 70% of the communities decided not to do it now. And, and so that was also another big drawback because we had to, lim we had to reduce the universe where we were working. And uh, fortunately through time, you know, neighboring communities have seen the work that we do. And now we're starting to see a demand for our work. And, and when you see a demand for the work that you're doing, it is much easier to work in the communities because there's already an expression of interest. Uh, but in the water sector, many times you don't see that demand. So, so at the beginning, we had to, you know, we had to find ways to, to find communities that were willing to work with us, that were meeting certain basic uh, agreements. And, and, and with time, we, were, we have been able now to be more strict and we're seeing more demand and we are able to get uh, better results. So, but, but it's really, you know, the commitment, the working, you know, seeing the people of our team uh, in a continuous basis, uh, when there's a conflict, trying to do the best to resolve it. And, and building a reputation that has been able to change that. Great. Uh, another um, of our attendees, Jasmine, is asking uh, an interesting and insightful question. Um, she's asking, what do you know about or, or what can be done about uh, issues not of biological contamination, but of chemical contamination of water bodies? She's particularly interested in refinery contamination to water bodies and, and air quality, but that doesn't seem like something that you were focusing on, at least for this presentation. So it'd be interesting to hear from you on, on that question. Uh, yes, it was really difficult to, to choose which topics to, to present. Uh -huh. uh, we, uh, in the study that we did in 300 communities, we found about 30% of the systems were distributing water with nitrates. Um, the nitrates come either from contam contamination with sewage in, in, the, in the sources of water or from uh, fertilizers, which the fertilizers are toxic, but if there's fertilizers in the water, there's also pesticides in the water. And it's really difficult to uh, test and understand and, and measure the pesticides because there are hundreds of them and they need different tests. But, but we're definitely seeing that uh, contamination occurring uh, from agricultural activities. Also in the center and north of Mexico, we observed a lot of arsenic and fluoride on the water, which hadn't been documented. Um, in, in, all of, in all of the samples that we did, about 20% had arsen, ar, arsenic and about 30% had fluoride. Um, later on, we, in addition to this study, we were able to um, for many years, we, we knew that there was, um, um, uh, there was a database of water quality that was produced by, in, without really an intention, like there, there was a big government program to install water fountains in schools. And so the, the, health min, no, the education ministry, which was in charge of installing the water fountains, asked the companies that won the licitation or the bids to uh, to install the water fountains to do water quality tests. And so they produce water quality tests, very comprehensive water quality tests in about 20,000 schools in Mexico. And, and we knew the institutions that had those results, but they were not opening them. 
And so through a, a, through a transparency platform in Mexico and through also collaboration with one of the institutions that had the data, we were able to access the data first by, I mean, this is, we have so many stories like this, but first by, you know, by mistake, they gave us a USB with the data and we were able to see the data, but we were not really allowed to, to share it. But once we saw the data, we were able to ask it in a right way so that through the transparency law, they had to give it to us. And, and they gave it to us in PDFs, like thousands of PDFs that were really difficult to, um, to process. And, but after months of processing them, we launched uh, a site where now you can go to, uh, when you can go to any locality and, and where there's data about this and see the water quality results. And we are observing thousands of communities that have arsenic and fluoride in their, in their, in pipe water. And this is, I mean, this is something that we, you know, the authorities hid for, hid for many years and, and that we really need we understand it really needs to come out so that people, uh, uh, you know, people start to, to, to ask for the human right to water to be able to, to met, including the, the water, water quality. So, so yes, we're seeing a lot of contamination happening. More directly related to refineries, if I understood correctly, um, the states in the Gulf of Mexico, especially here in the South, Veracruz, Tabasco, Campeche, they have, uh, they have tons of contaminants in, in, their, in their water sources. And again, this is pipe, water that goes to the cities. The sample was taken in the school, but all the, na the neighborhood where the school is located is, is getting that water. So, so I'll share here the, the link and, and I'm happy to talk offline more about this if, if this is sound interesting. And Great. Um, so one of one of our attendees asked if education efforts have proven to be one of the, the big challenges since it isn't obvious to people necessarily when water is contaminated. You spoke of, of people feeling, uh, you know, a strong affinity for and a sense that the water coming from their jug is, you know, fresh and clean because it's cool and because it, you know, has, a, a, you know, it's how they've always lived. So how do you do the educational outreach to help people understand what the risks are associated with um, contaminated water and that contaminated water may emerge in places where you wouldn't necessarily recognize or, or expect it? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I struggle to understand why water, why the water sector is so complex. Uh, it's really, I mean, I see how in other sectors that they're not easy, they're difficult, you know, uh, getting cookstoves right is not easy. It's uh, getting a solar uh, electrification program in, in rural communities is again, is not easy and it requires a lot of work, but, but, but water is like, you, you, you kind of understand something, put into practice and then come up with another problem. And, and it's, it, has been, it has been a big, big journey of, of understanding the, kind of the deep, com deep complexity the water has water sector has. And I think one of the key elements is that we as humans don't, don't have good feedback of, of water quality. And, and, and then we fall into this big trap that we all humans are very weak into it, which we discount the value of the future. And, and so um, the combination of not having senses that allow you to understand the quality of water, the problems related to water coming in the future, whether it's diarrhea in three or four days, whether it's malnutrition, in a few years taking its toll or whether it's cancer developed by arsenic in five, 10 years uh, from now, uh, it, it really, uh, I mean, th that uh, nonlinear response between water quality and, and health problems and that lack of senses, it, 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 I think it's one of the core elements that make it, make it so complex and difficult. Um, so what do, what do we do for that? I think investing in water quality testing is crucial. Uh, Communities in general have heard that water might be contaminated, but when they see a sample being collected and changing color because it, it was in contact with feces and it has E. coli on it, it is, a, it is an experience that definitely drives a, a desire to, to, to change things in the community and to change how water is being managed. Um, also, finding, you know, having a document that says that your water has arsenic is very empowering in the sense that, that now you can, 
mobilize people in your community and go with the authorities and say, this is, this is arsenic, this is, you know, uh, 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 a very contaminant, uh, a very bad contaminant that it's affecting our lives. And, and so water quality testing really needs to happen more. Um, there are many burdens to do it in the sense that in Mexico for a really long time, uh, organizations and researchers have done water quality tests and the authorities say, well, but you're not an authorized laboratory. So your tests are not, uh, we're not gonna take them as official. And, and most of authorized laboratories, they serve the industry. So they have really high fares. The tests that they use uh, don't make sense for rural communities. And so there's a huge gap for that. And, and so democratizing water quality testing and um, you know, ensuring that if not users and people themselves, but at least community-based water management organizations can do water quality testing, uh, it, it's kind of a critical path. And, and it's, on, it's also something where a few organizations are working on this, uh, but more investment should go into there. And, and one of the bad things is that, you know, more and more government institutions have less funding and they, they are only interested in investing in infrastructure and not in, Developing capacities or or doing water quality tests, so it's a, it's a big challenge. That is a challenge, and we did we did receive a question asking if the, um, your organization is receiving support from the Mexican government for its work. Um, it sounds like that's challenging. Uh, no, I mean we feel like salmon's always uh, swimming against the current. If that analogy is useful for the places where most of you live. <laughs> and, and so, uh, uh, no, I mean, and in general, we don't depend on government funding. Uh, we participated, uh, I mean, there was this, this water fountain program that I was mentioning. You know, you, uh, there was this moment where like the Mexican government did a census of schools and they realized that half of schools didn't have bathrooms or running water. And we knew that because we work in the field, but they, they had to acknowledge it officially because there was a, a school census. And around the same time, Mexico also acknowledged that we had an obesity and uh, diabetes pandemic. And, and so the last administration, the last federal administration said, we need to invest in water in schools. And that was amazing. But then, you know, again, like public policies that are designed in a, in a desk, they said, we need to install water fountains in schools. So let's develop a program to do that. And 100% of the funding went to the installation of infrastructure. Nothing of the funding went into developing uh, pedagogical materials, part, you know, getting the community, the educational communities to participate and to adopt these technologies. And, and one of the other challenges is that they say, well, if you want to participate in this program, to have a water fountain in your school, you need to have water running in your school. So it discriminated the schools that had most problems. And so for three years, we tried to convince the federal government to do a pilot on rainwater harvesting in schools. We had done it in hundreds of, well, in dozens of schools. Other organizations had done it also in many other schools. And we had all the evidence that it could work really well. Um, and we were going to do supposedly a pilot of a hundred schools. We ended up doing a pilot of 14 schools. And, and it was at the end of the last administration. And we were, I mean, it was um, an important moment because for the first time the government invested in rainwater harvesting in schools, but then there was a change in government and the new government uh, that it, you know, it stopped that program. And, and now it's giving the money directly to the schools which in, it has a positive angle because schools then get to decide on what they use it. But then in a way, they're also not absorbing the responsibility of ensuring that kids, when they go to a public school, they have some basic services like, uh, like a safe uh, sanitation facility or that they can drink safe water in the schools. So, so working with the government has been, I mean, we think it's the way and we need to make the government work for communities. Uh, but but it, it, it's really difficult to work with, with the government and especially to, to be able to channel their funding. I will also share, I, I don't know if you see the, the links that I'm typing here. If yeah. not, I would like to ask for your help, but I, I will also type here another website, which is pretty cool uh, that we developed to, 
to help people understand the rainwater harvesting potential in Mexico and to design very like in, in a minute, be able to understand how much water you can collect in your home based on where you are. And it includes, uh, uh, you can either use data from the last 30 years or a projection with climate change and how it's gonna affect, it's likely going to affect uh, precipitation in the place where you're located. And then you can, you can use it if you're a school, if you're a house, if you're a business, if you're a community, it's pretty neat. So I'll type it here and maybe can, I don't know if there are. Yeah, those are coming through just fine. Um, and, and thank you for sharing those, uh, those resources. I'm sure that they'll be useful to folks. Um, there's a couple of more questions that I will sort of merge together because they're asking a, a similar thing. And I think that they're appropriate as we're, we're coming up on uh, time to wrap things up. So I'm just gonna read verbatim from this question. Um, this participant says, first, I just want to thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting and insightful. And second, I just wanted to ask, as an aspiring water resources engineer with an interest in working with rural communities, what are your recommendations for getting your foot in the door with this type of work? And another student asks, how can I get involved with an organization like yours? So do you have any advice for our, uh, our aspiring folks who are looking to do work like this going forward? Yes, I mean, I, I think... I, again, it's an underrepresented sector. Uh, there are very few people working on this. We definitely need more engineers, more economists, more engineers from different, uh, you know, civil engineers, environmental engineers, uh, mechanical engineers. Uh, uh, we need we need many more professionals uh, working on these type of challenges. As one of our main advisors of Kevin Arni Sintana. Uh, and myself, uh, uh, Professor Dan Kamen wrote many years ago, like the uh, mundane, sci mundane science is like, there's, you know, the challenges, the engineering and the scientific challenges and the practice challenges in working in rural communities are really interesting and really amazing. And, and they are as difficult as what sometimes we, as difficult and, and you know, and in, uh, enriching to work on them as, as sometimes other projects that are more visual, like you know, reaching Mars or you know, designing a, um, a car that drives by itself. So, so first, I mean, the first thing that I want to say is that working on energy, water, agriculture in rural communities, it is, it has been amazing to be able to work on this, and 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 so I definitely encourage you to to do this. It's also important to even if now you know we are. Okay, we're the largest organization in Mexico working on water, but we started as students and, and all of it has been little steps. And, and so there is, there's, you know, each of you can, uh, can create a path, whether it's collaborating with an existing organization, whether it's starting a new organization, um, social enterprise, or whether in, in academia uh, working on, on these issues. And, um, so, so there are different different paths that can be taken. Uh, for us, what was critical when we were students was to be able to merge uh, what we were learning on the classroom. Uh, so we learned many things through our classes, uh, and at the same time, we were spending most summers and winters uh, working or visiting rural communities. So, so being able to tie what we were seeing in these rural communities and what we were learning on the classroom was great. And the third piece of this that we, we think was a, a magical triangle for us was being able to do research. Uh, because many of the challenges that we see in the field and that we're learning uh, on, on, on the classroom, on classes, uh, they're not easy. And, and so you need the dedication of the research and the tools and the power that research uh, can, can deliver to try to understand and tackle these, these uh, challenges. And, and so, um, you know, more than giving specific names of organizations or what to do, I think if, if these, these are topics that you're interested in, whether they're in the water sector or not, uh, if at Humboldt State University or any other space where you are, if you're able to combine uh, going to the field, the practice, the, the classroom and the research into, into a project and, and kind of trying to create more than a circle, a spiral that each of these elements nurtures the other one, 
then then I, I think that's that 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 was kind of the, the recipe for us. And of course, if we did not design this, we were very fortunate to be in a university that started to invest more in their students and uh, and that uh, and that allow uh, had many programs where, where you know allow students to go to the field and and, and be able to tie uh, these three elements. And and so I'm 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 sure also that at the um, at Humboldt State University, you also foster uh, these connections, and and so I think we're living in a, a students where we're, I'm not a student anymore, but very recently I was, and 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 we are living in a very uh, very interesting phase of where academia is much more closer to uh, uh, to the field, and 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 we can make a huge difference. All right. Well, I think we'll we'll uh, move towards closing it up there. I really want to thank you, Fermin. This was fascinating. I really appreciate your taking the time to speak with us. And to the audience tonight, thanks again for joining us. I want to remind everybody that our next talk will be on Thursday, March 25th at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, architect Amon Taboni will describe his research on the ecological superblock, neo-nature, the city and the Anthropocene. And we'll put the um, link into the chat and I'll uh, also put up the flyer as we, as we close out tonight. Uh, we'll also be po posting a recording of today's presentation later this spring. Uh, and you can visit the Schott Center's website at uh, schottcenter.org slash speakers for recent videos as well as registration for upcoming webinars. Um, I really appreciate your taking the time to join us this evening. I'm gonna close things out uh, with this, uh, flyer for our upcoming talk uh and I, I i yeah please please reach out if you have any any questions you can find me kevin fingerman uh and others at the shot center thanks thank you everyone and especially to maya Sintana, kevin and arnie Bye -bye. thanks so much for joining us for me it was really really a, a pleasure having you here